Blog Talk Radio. Good afternoon. Welcome to another episode of Financing Your Business Today. Tim Jacquet, your host. Today, I'm delighted to talk about Eleanor Jacquet, one of our American jazz legends, the king of tenor saxophone. Today, we have a panel. I have his daughter, Pamela. Are you there? I am here. Great. And I have Carol, his manager, a longtime manager. Carol? I'm here. Okay. And I have Joyce, who worked with him at Harvard. Are you there, Joyce? Yes, Joyce Kaufman. Okay. And before we begin, I think it is fitting for us to go into a clip of his, which is probably about five minutes long. And then we're going to talk about his very roots, his very beginning from Louisiana. And we're we'll uh, next going to his career. After that, we're going to his scholarship and enlightenment years. And then we're going to awards, dedication, and his foundation. So let me begin with this. We'll start with a, a clip from Texas Tenor. His video that was made for almost 20 years ago in black and white. Okay, we're back now. Thank you for listening to that episode. I guess let's start from the very beginning from this little town in Louisiana, where he's from. Carol or Pamela, you want to start from there? Try and give us a short scenario. How did he get started with his family in Louisiana? How they migrated to Houston and beyond? So if someone can start in on that, is it Carol or Pamela? One? Yeah, I can tell you, I, w- I actually was down there. Illinois' cousin, Willie, is still alive, and he showed me. It's, on a, it's, it's a plantation. It's, it's, you know, it's the same family owned the plantation then. It's the same name family owns the property. Now he showed me where the cottage was, a little wooden house, I guess you'd say a cabin, where he was born on a plantation. And his parents, he was born to a Indian, American Indian mother and a French Creole father. And his namesake, Jean-Baptiste Jolivet Jacquet, although he could sign only sign his name with an X, actually he owned a lot of property around there. Mm-hmm. The white people have had succeeded in taken from him actually on one of his pieces of property. He had a racetrack. He was just very successful. But most of all, he knew how to play all the instruments. And he taught these instruments to his children. And Illinois' father, Gilbert, played the violin and the bass violin. He also played the tuba. And he had he had a t- what they called a territory band there in Houston because before Illinois was, at, when he was still infant, they moved, the family moved to Houston to hopefully escape the racial difficulties. But even though he grew up in Houston, he still kept his roots in the cradle of jazz music down there in Louisiana because he'd go back for the summers. And Willie says that all summer long he'd be dancing in one of the houses there. And they did shuffle dancing at that time. And so He, Illinois, grew up on stage from a very early age. He was the youngest member of the Jaquette brothers who danced in front of their father's territory band. Uh, So he was singing and dancing, he says, by the age of three. So his roots in jazz music and the cradle of jazz music are very deep. Okay, and within his family, he's the youngest out of six, Julius. Isabella, Johnny Litton, Mary, Robert Russell, and himself. So Robert, also, I mean, not Robert, Robert Russell was also in his band or played trumpet and drums? or. But, and his older brothers, Linton, played the drums. And okay. Julius played, Linton, yeah, played the drums. And Julius played the tenor saxophone. So that's where he got his start on those instruments. When he went to high school... 
the only instrument available at the time he began were the was drums. And so he began on drums. And then he noticed in the corner of the band room this little saxophone. He says, What's that? He said, Okay, that's available. It's a little tenor I mean a little soprano saxophone. It was a pipe shape, the original pipe shape. So he began on that. Eventually and what he was playing drums in the marching band and uh-huh. saxophone in the concert band. And then eventually his father, and he talks about his father, twisting those old-fashioned purses where you kind of like twist the little metal things to open and then he pulled out a little bit of money and uh-huh. he and he went to town with that money and bought himself an alto. So be- while Illinois was still in high school, he was playing in this professional story band, Milt Larkin. And they were traveling, you know, doing the route of territory bands playing and uh, one trip up to Kansas City. That's where he first met Charlie Parker. And they he was playing alto, of course. And they met each other and they realized their alto, their tent, their styles were so alike. Oh, no, I said they jammed all night until the next morning and almost missed when the bus left. Wow. He was playing professional and the older jazz older musicians in town what always wanted Illinois to play with him because he always had these riffs he was he's creative he just was an unusual extraordinary musician and extraordinary being and the older musicians always wanted him to play in a group and his mother would always make them promise to bring him home by by night Wow. And I interviewed a 90-year-old, at that time, this is like five, six years ago, a musician that played with him and talked about how they used to go out, were on, playing out in an out, out, a little honky tonk out, out of town, and they didn't even have lights on their car, and they had to put whole flashlights on from the running board to get to the gig, and then they got $6 for the whole night. So it's quite, a, quite an unusual story. Now, his years at in the Houston area, and I know there's still some few family members still there in Bruce Harding Lafayette that remember those days, but I'm not sure in the bio, he did he attend Phyllis Wheatley High School back in the in that time in the 30s? Oh, know- yeah, that was very important. That was where he went to school. Okay. And also, another family was a long-term member with Papa Jack at Our Mother of Mercy Church in Houston as well had a house right down the street from the church. So, right, he, talked, he said how his mother would go to Mass every morning before she went to work. She worked, I think, at a hospital. Mm-hmm. And then she'd come home and she'd make food for the whole family, six, six children and all of that. But she made Mass every morning. And then most their whole yard, instead of being a grass, she planted a food. She had everything growing there. And then at holiday time, she would make whiskey and make extra money for whiskey. And she also kept herbs growing because she, being an American Indian, she knew how to cure people. He talked about some band coming through and the drummer was very sick and she cured the drummer with herbs and said that she could just put her hand on your head and your headache could get better. His mother was an amazing person. Wow. Wow. That's a really amazing story. What also I think in the notes that you send, and also in the interview, they mentioned something about Nat King Cole quickly recognized his unique quality. Can you talk about his experience with with uh, Nat King Cole? Yeah, that was his best friend, probably his best friend in jazz at that time. Actually, even when Nat King Cole was thinking about leaving his first wife and, and thinking about marrying his second wife, he came out made a trip out here to Illinois' house to ask Illinois' opinion. But (laughs) they they were very close, and uh, he talks about how they'd be traveling together, and uh, with the black problem, they'd have to, they would turn down their lights, and so they couldn't see that the people were, that they were black. It was just, it was, but mainly, Nat King Cole introduced Illinois to Lionel Hampton. When Lionel Hampton was breaking up the band with Benny Goodman, out of Catalina Island. Wow. And he introduced Illinois to Lionel Hampton, who then, you heard in the clip, hired him. And that King Cole's trio was supposed to be the rhythm section. 
but they never panned out. Right. And Pamela, back into your experience, grandmother was an American Indian. What was that like with you and your family, hands on hands with your dad, with your grandfather? I'm not sure that you have any recall being in Houston or when the family moved to, I think, was it Los Angeles or something? Some of the family moved to Los Angeles, several of my father's brothers. But what I remember the most was kind of funny. You know, the French language that we spoke growing up was called Patois. Uh-huh. And I remember my father speaking to me in that language and conversing. And then when I went to high school, you know, the choice is, okay, what language are you going to learn? And I, my dad wanted me to learn French. But interestingly enough, because Patois was an idiomatic language, it's a French derivative language, it caused me extreme difficulty in understanding (laughs) French because I learned, you know, the idioms in a different way. And so it it was really funny. I can remember so many times speaking Patois in my French classes and my teachers wondering what I was talking about. Sounded French, but it didn't, you know, it didn't relate too much. But the other thing I remember the most, too, was my father was actually a very good cook. And I'm sure that came from his mom's cooking. And so we had all of the Creole, you know, meals, the the ajoufe and the andouille sausages and the rices and gumbo. I mean, my house used to smell like a restaurant sometimes when my father would get into the kitchen. He loved bread pudding. He would make bread pudding. He was just an interesting person. You know, you wouldn't think that a musician so dedicated to his instrument would actually be such a good cook. But he was a good cook. And he was fun. And I don't remember my grandparents too much because they really didn't travel up to the New York area where I grew up. I actually think they passed early on. But I remember the family, I remember the history, and I remember the brothers and sisters. And it was a great time, a very stimulating household with good food, good music all the time. A lot of fun. Wow, you're making me hungry already. Did you get that bread pudding recipe? We have all the recipes passed down, and I think it wasn't until I got a little older and enjoyed being in the kitchen that I I relish those recipes and often (laughs) whip up a few meals that I'm very famous for. So, yeah, we have a few of those recipes. Okay, wow. Regarding your uncles and aunts, about Aunt May, John Lynn, and the others, anything about uh, Russell? Now, Russell played with him as well, within his Yes, band. And, and I know Carol can talk more about that, but I can remember growing up that Russell traveled with my father quite a bit. We, Russell came into the New York area and stayed there for quite some time working with my dad. Russell was an accomplished musician on his, in his own right. Mm-hmm. He wrote a lot of, of scores for music. He trained in music at the college level. Very instrumental, I think, in you know my father's desire to even create music. But let me give it, turn it over to Carol as well. Okay, before we go there, let's talk about Russell. Talk about his name real quick. If you know, out of the six siblings, why would he name Gibbert would name his last child? Is it how you pronounce it, Jean Baptiste? Jean Baptiste. Jean Baptiste. I'm sorry, Jean Baptiste. Then versus the firstborn, any history behind that? Why at his very last child he decided to name of his great grandfather? I'm not sure I know, Carol. Do you know why he named Dad Jean Baptiste? That's my name as well, by the way. That's oh. my middle name. So yeah, maybe well, just out yeah. of out of recognition of the grandfather, and you know, the name Illinois came from the midwife for his birth. Wow, uh, came from Chicago. Oh. And Illinois, yeah. Illinois means it, it's really Illini Wick, which means superior men. Wow. And so the midwife uh, gave him the Illinois, and of course the Jean Baptiste was because of recognition of the, how great his grandfather was. So he was an amazing man. Wow. One question, real quick. Um, if you want to call in, the number is 347 324 3460. If you want to call in and have a question, if you do have a question, just press the number one and we can put you online. Again, the number to call in is 347-324-3460, or you can pose a question in the chat room and I'm going to read it out aloud. Back to, because it, 
Last week, we did a story with the entire family with Russell, and he talked about the history from Europe until today and talked about all the siblings. But it was just amazing, as you just mentioned, where that name Illinois came from, the midwife. It's not in the history books, but it's a connection from the great-grandfather, and then it moves down, skip, you know, to Gilbert, and then he named his last child then. I guess let's go into now his career. I guess now he's in New York. Uh, anybody want to go ahead? I guess Carol want to talk about his career, how he got started, where he played the clip. So if you can go take us from that story of flying home to, I guess, the six. Yeah, I, I want to say two years after flying home, he made a, a monumental contribution to jazz music, which people don't normally know. Everybody equates him to flying home, which with flying home, he created an entirely new style for the tenor saxophone. See, because he grew up dancing, when he was playing the saxophone, he was still dancing with his saxophone. So he had this very energetic style on stage that was just, it was contagious to the people who were watching him. But in 19, that was 40, 1942 when he recorded that. In 1944, he had just left the Cab Calloway band because he left the, the Lionel Hampton band. It was getting, his health was compromised because the schedule, Hamp was always rehearsing. But anyway, then he joined Cab Calloway. He replaced Chewberry, who had gotten killed in an automobile accident. He replaced Chewberry, and he had spent a year in Cap Calloway's band, and in Cap Calloway's band, naturally, they were doing mostly, his job was mostly just uh, accompanying Cap Calloway on his many hits. He had some features, but he wasn't allowed to play Flying Home, and at that time, Flying Home was grown through the roof. It was dominating all jukeboxes, but he wasn't allowed for a whole year. He couldn't play Flying Home. And so he had just left the Cap Calloway, and while he was accompanying, Cab Calloway on his vocals, he was doubling on clarinet. So now he's left the Cab Calloway band, and his friend, dear friend, Nat King Cole said, would you play with us? There is a benefit concert. Sleepy Lagoon organization had formed it because there had been a race riot in Los Angeles, so they were trying to raise money to restore Los Angeles. So, So Nat King Cole says, would you play with me? Sure, I'll play with you. So he gets on stage. It was at the Philharmonic Auditorium. The auditorium was filled to the rafters. He had Nat King Cole behind him on piano playing everything right. And he was so inspired in a creative urge, he inadvertently applied clarinet fingerings to the tenor saxophone. This created harmonic overtones, which extended the upper register of the tenor saxophone by two and one half octaves. Wow. And then then the, the audience would go wild, and then he plays high notes, and then he'd go down to the bottom of his horn and honk with a low note. And he was playing, he was just playing with his, and he was expressing himself, which he hadn't been able to do for a whole year, so it was unbelievable. That was called blues, sometimes called philharmonic blues. That solo created such an excitement that it allowed Norman Grant to form what was called Jazz at the Philharmonic, which took, and, and with that solo, everybody wanted to start playing like Illinois Jacket. So the tenor saxophone became the most, most popular instrument in jazz music, number one. And number two, the solo allowed Norman Grant to, to form Jazz at the Philharmonic, which took jazz music out of honking tongues and jazz clubs and into concert halls throughout the world. So he, his impact was monumental. Wow. So taking it, I mean, so you're talking about he just a uh, matter of fingering with the clarinet, he created this high range sound of this particular piece. That and nobody- they say that they say that. What he did on that solo created the blueprint for what came later, which was what, which the music evolved into rhythm and blues and rock and roll. And there was a book written by Propes and Dawson, 
the book was written, it said, what is what was the first rock and roll record? It said blues. So literally, other people say that Illinois Jaquette established the blueprint for what came later. First rock and see the rhythm and blues was ahead a lot of that honking. And there were people <laughs> there were there were I don't remember their names right now, but there were artists who did only what Illinois was doing, just having fun with the horn, because Illinois was a consummate musician. I mean he could play everything. But some musicians just took that playful thing and made a career out of it. Wow. And that became rhythm and blues. So during that time, a lot of people wasn't playing a tenor saxophone, so he kind of paved the way for this new Made it the most popular instrument in jazz music wow. at that time. Wow. It's unusual sound. Yeah, I remember even coming back in the 80s, uh, a lot of them started referring back to him regarding a particular style because it, it brought the music into a different level than it was with other saxophones. Mm-hmm like alto sax and so forth. Anything else regarding his career? I know you like to spend a lot of time in Europe. Did he spend any time in the Asian countries? Or kind of tell us during his mid-career from the 40s, 50s, and 60s, did he spend a lot of time in the United States? He spent a lot of time in Europe. I know there are some couple of places in New York we've seen reference to, a Blue Note Club and so forth. Can you talk about that time? Well, the Blue Note, he was playing... That was the big band, because like the big band is like the last chapter of his career. But in in the 60s and the 70s, he teamed up with Joe Jones on drums and Milt, oh boy, the organist. Milt Milt Buckner. Milt Milt Buckner. Buckner. Milt Buckner, right. Milt Buckner and Joe Jones. And they were so, it's mostly Europe, mostly Europe and up in Toronto, big Boston. He was very popular in Boston. And so then Milt Buckner passed and then he teamed up with, made a quintet with Slam Stewart on string bass. And so that that was what he was doing at the time. Then Joyce Kaufman, actually my oldest son was a student at Harvard and he, I had my children playing, playing, uh, taking music lessons and teacher was teaching them jazz music. So when Gregory got to Harvard, he took this course, History of Jazz Music. And one day he called Mom, Milt, Milt Hinton was just here for an interview. Do you think Illinois would like to come? So Illinois got up there for an interview, and then jo- Joyce Kaufman took the ball and ran with it. Joyce, are you there? Yes, I'm here, Carol, and I really enjoyed hearing your stories and Pamela's stories. And remember when you came running up to Illinois after the lecture and said, oh, please come back? And then you got him back to all those different things, jamming at Harvard, and, and tell about that. Okay. Is it is that the signal, Timothy, to Yeah, to let's, start? let's take one break real quick. It's usually after 30 minutes. Let's take okay. one break, and we're going to play Robin's Nest, and then we're going straight into his scholarship years and more music. Just about 33 minutes. Robin's Nest, by. Okay, that was Robin's Nest by Illinois GK. I guess uh, Joyce Hoffman, I guess you guy can continue regarding his, his scholarship years. Yes, well, when you brought us on the radio, I did something that I didn't realize I was doing. Whenever Illinois would see me or we'd talk on the phone, he would make a beautiful poem out of my name. He'd say, <laughs> Joyce Hoffman. And I did that unconsciously when you were introducing us. Not quite that way, but what he did was what I'm, I'm the perspective I'm getting in this moment as I'm hearing the music and Carol's excitement and Pamela, his daughter, family. I think before I talk about Harvard years, I'm going to have to go back a little bit to my roots because he always talked about you have to go back to your roots to to explain your life, to get source from your life and your living just carrying over from the 60s and 70s. I grew up in Brookline, Mass., and my next-door neighbors were my Jacquette fanatics. They would go, when he would come to Lenny's on the turn to Boston, it was 8 o'clock in the morning until the last note of Flying Home was played. And I heard about this from when I was four years old. My father was also a jazz trumpeter. He played in the territory bands in Boston, 
when he was a teenager on trumpet. And then he went into the war and went into dentistry after that. But he played trumpet his whole life. And he would put on Count Basie, Louis Armstrong, Duke Ellington, and he would close every night his practice session on the radio, on the records with Illinois Jacquette's Desert Winds album. And so I had rec- I had memorized that album by the time I was probably eight or nine years old. So uh, I was brought up. I had all these uncles, Louis Armstrong, Louis and Illinois and, you know, Count. I mean, we talked about them at the dinner table as if they were part of our family. So that's my personal background. I also started playing instruments as a child, but it was just part of my, my I thought everybody had uncles like that, you know. So at the age of 12, my neighbors brought me to Lenny. Him, I played with as drum teacher, Alan Dawson. And that, of course, I've never forgotten that because I saw this amazing drummer like played like a butterfly. And Illinois would come over and he would visit all the tables in the club. And I think people just felt that they were part of his family and he was part of their family and he knew everybody's name in the club came back and he was a person who connected with people he was extremely interested in people and he memorized things about people so when he saw them he would say how's your daughter did she get into you know that college or how's your mom is she okay he'd always say to me how's your mother because my mother was ill later in life he, he, I don't know how he did that. You know, he was a celebrity, but he connected with people. That that was his entire modus operandi. And then the other parts about him I thought about the, before we go into the Harvard events, actually, is how, how he was innovating and thoughtful with everything he did. Was And he thought about it a lot. Very deep thinker, very brilliant stylist and Everything was conscious in the way he approached. Every single note he played was intentional and soulful. And we can hear that. I guess we're hearing it in the, over the phone now on your show. It's very deep to hear that. And then the other thing is educating. He was constantly curious about everything in his sight. He asked about questions about maybe something would be sitting on the table. And he would say, "Well, what, well, what's where did they? What was that made?" And we'd look on the back, was pan. I don't know. Was interested in. And when his daughter talked about cooking and his, his, that he was an interesting person, that that was the tip of the iceberg. I I didn't know that about him, about his cooking. But he he also was a born teacher. He was an educator. Whenever I spoke with him, I learned something about music, whether it be that day's rehearsal with the Harvard band we put together, or for 20 years after that, I would call him on the phone, and he we would have a drum lesson on the phone, and we would talk about what it means to keep time for a jazz band. You know, never let your feet off the pedals of the jazz drum set. And also, when you're a saxophone player, you keep time with your horn. And when you're a leader of the band, you... When you take a solo, you're the leader of the band in the way you express your rhythm. And I learned so many things from him just from talking on the phone for 20 minutes or an hour. And so I consider myself a student and as my main jazz mentor, along with Alan Dawson, my drum teacher. So that's kind of the, my, my my present moment overview of Illinois is that you don't really read about in a history book where someone was and what they did. You know, the kind of person he was beyond brilliant. And because there was so much style involved with his, the way he dressed, the way he ate, the way he, and the way he talked, the way he talked in poetry. I could go on a, a while, but if you have any questions, I, I can also go into how the whole Harvard chapter happened. Yeah, let's go ahead and move towards it. The Harvard chapter. How okay. I was teaching. I was had been a student at Harvard in my in music, and my invited me back to teach with her for a number of years in music classes. Louise Fuskirchen was a very popular professor 
at Harvard in the music department, and she uh, offered very large lecture classes. And uh, I was a teaching assistant at that time, and I also taught classes in improvisation, and I was organizing jam sessions on the Harvard campus. At that time, the the jazz program was just started with Tom Everett. He had two jazz, and how they did it in the 30s, 40s, and 50s, I knew that the jam session was a major way that not only did people compete, but also how they uh, learned from each other. You know, they would hear each other play, and, uh, you know, they, that's how they would learn jazz from each other. So my idea was to create music. For instance, met in the practice rooms wonderful young and in fact, Don Braden was a, a, a tenor saxophonist who rehearsed with a wonderful pianist named Leon Grunbaum. They were freshman roommates at Harvard, and I could tell that they were already going to already tell that they were going to go on to be professional jazz musicians. And so I would play music with them in my T- TA office, and we kind of formed a little group and. I happened to be in the building walking through the building, giving a lecture at the class offered by Tom Everett at Harvard. Um, and so I, I literally ran down the hallway because I had known him from childhood and from seeing him in the club. And I, I and because I was organizing to him straight through the chairs, and we always talk about that moment when I just went right up to him and said, I'm... Joyce Kaufman and I organizing jam sessions on campus at Harvard, and he said, well, if you have another one, let me know, and I'll come play. There is my manager right over there, and he pointed me to Carol Sherrick, and I I was amazed and went right over. We exchanged numbers, and I followed up, and we our first jam session was in the Agassiz Theater on the Harvard campus, the Radcliffe Yard. And we filled up the the whole this is a small sort of musical theater space on a Wednesday afternoon. Even though it was a work day in the middle of the day, it was filled up. And there were, I invited professionals from the Carla Bley Band who happened to be home, Gary Valente, Illinois, the really side man at that time was the wonderful guitarist who's now Tony Bennett's guitarist, a great sergeant. So I mixed up Illinois with his professional level, and then the undergraduates came. I don't know, there might have been 10 or 15 undergraduates, and then I invited some of my children's students who I was teaching at the time. So I wanted to have a multi-generational jazz experience with under Illinois' direction. And the jam session must have gone on for three hours. I'm currently writing it up. Wow. So it was such a huge event that the director of the arts, the Office for the Arts, Myra Maiman, was open to having him come back to do an innovative entire semester with the students. Do you want to cut in? Yeah. Harvard, I know a lot of people really didn't know that they really had a type of music program. So they have a full type during that time, a uh, full time program. I know they specialize in musicology. Is it mainly on that setting, or they have actual performance school for artists to study music? And to- well, Harvard has always had a a program which offers music theory and music history. Okay. Um, at that time, it was in transition. They in it, they brought in they had one chamber music class, and a professor would coach a chamber music group. That was it. And the all the other music and arts, which is still the case, is extracurricular. Okay. And so the jazz bands that Tom Everett was running at Harvard were extracurricular, like the football band, the concert band, and then he had the two jazz bands. So when Illinois, had talk, when I was talking with Carol in Illinois about coming to Harvard to do semester, which was unheard of at that time. Usually they had something called learning from performers when a person like Sarah Vaughn would come in and just talk to the students for about an hour. And I thought, well, gee, could we do more than that? Or sometimes Tom Everett would have a guest for a weekend and they would do a lot of workshops with the jazz band. But I thought, well, can we get some deeper learning happening and 
you know, past the oral tradition of a jam session, could we have more, more, you know, for the students? So I had to raise funds to bring him to the campus, live on campus for a whole semester, and it was completely innovative at that time, and no one understood kind of what I was trying to do, but I think they got it after afterwards. So I had to raise money from various sources. Because he was the first African-American resident at Harvard, in the history of Harvard, and some of the racial issues had been, this was in 1982, 83. The Harvard Foundation had been established in the late 70s to, to try to promote racial un, multi, multicultural and racial understanding on campus. And so the Office for the Arts directed me to they came up with a very small amount of money. Basically, he did it well, a labor of love the first time he was there for that first semester. We put together a big band for him to work, and Carol put together some beautiful charts for the students to read. We practiced twice a week with the help of Tom Everett sending his students over from his established jazz band, which was very generous of him. He, You know, some people can be... You know, those are my students, but he gave me a list, and I hunted all over the campus in the jazz, in the uh, practice rooms. I would knock on the door if I heard a, a student playing saxophone or clarinet. I would knock on the door and say, you want to be in a jazz band with Illinois Jacquette, and they would wow. jump. So I was a little bit of a spy in the practice rooms all over the campus. <laughs> it was a lot of fun. Did you and do any Yes, go ahead. I'm sorry. Did you do any collaboration with the College of Music right there in Boston? Slightly. I did bring a bass player over, but he didn't quite make the cut, so we, oh. we brought in a professional <laughs> bass player. Excuse me, Berkeley. But it, it was, yeah, the bass player, you probably know, too. I mean, I was playing the drums in the band, but I needed a good bass player to, for, to set the groove and keep good time. Illinois' entire philosophy of music has to do with the time and keeping the time, you know, whether you're a drummer or a bass player or a soloist or, you know, a person in the section. So there was a little bit of your interest in you would ask. We had to let the bass player go, and I did finally hire a professional bass player. It made a huge difference in the whole entire thing. He was blaming it on me, actually, on the time. And then when we switched the bass, everything was fine. That's a long story. But, you know, I think he thought I was a little off with the time. And I knew it wasn't me. And I just said, okay, let's get rid of that bass player. And we switched the new, you know, the professional in. And then it was beautiful. So, you know, you have to have that marriage between the bass and the drums in jazz. It's inescapable. If it doesn't work. In any case, Ron Della Chiesa, some of the innovations that we made with the Harvard Project was that I reached out to the whole community, and we were covered on all the radio stations. I'm doing okay on my radio interview right now, but he taught me how to do radio interviews because he was so classy on the radio. And we did television. The 10 o'clock news, Christopher Lydon interview came to the campus and filmed us for the 10 o'clock news. Uh, so it, it brought jazz to at Harvard to a much higher visibility, a huge impact on, on the whole Boston community to know that Illinois Jacquette was in town at Harvard, and all the celebrities of jazz showed up at the concert and sat in. The concert went on for hours. It was May Arnett showed up, and she sang, and Leon Collins did a spontaneous tap dance on the stage and did a split into the pit of the theater. It was just like being probably at the Apollo Theater. Wow. It was amazing. So after that, the they came up with more money. We had him back a second semester in order to document it with video because we realized unspeakably great was happening between the jazz community and we videotaped all the rehearsals and uh, to to document the oral history, the oral oral tradi tradition of jazz, how he transmitted his style to the students in the rehearsals. And I, again, I'm writing that up by looking at the videos later and uh, now. And the you know the effect that it had on the students was very powerful. 
because he took on every student as a, almost like a private student. They would consult him about their mouthpieces, and many of them have gone on to be professional musicians. Don Braden, oh, there's someone, Russ Gershon went on to, he run, he's run either orchestra for years and started his own record company. The alto player, Carol, who played in the Illinois band. Oh, yeah, and his father was saxophone and actually said Illinois moved too much on stage. <laughs> oh, yeah. I can't his remember his, <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry we can't remember his name now. But a lot of people went on, including myself, to be professional jazz musicians as a result of the experiences we had with this master musician who was such a born teacher. And so after the innovation of the also the innovation of the video documentation at the university caused Harvard to then videotape all of their visiting artists from then on. And now there's a 20-year a, a year archive of all the visiting artists that have been at Harvard. I mean, it's an amazing effect, impact that it has on the entire culture of the campus. And now half of the students on campus are involved with the arts. I mean, it was a huge impact on the campus that that happened at the way it did because of his visits and his repeated visits after the 1980, well, we, this happened in 1982 was the original jam session, and then 1983 was our first concert in November, excuse me, April of 83, and then November of 1984 was the second concert that we were able to videotape and document, you know, the uh, leading up to it. Wow. And he kept coming back for master classes for quite a few years after that. Yes. And uh, although I mentioned to you that I went on and he really was my my jazz uncle in the sense of I could call him and Carol anytime and just say hello as family. And we would talk jazz and, and rhythm and drumming. But I think the thing that he left me with the most is the, his axiom, practice everything. And be prepared, you know, for whatever you're going to do. Be prepared thoroughly and practice. And then the other thing that I remember, one of the last things he said to me was, the longer you spend in music, religion. Wow. I guess we'll take another break real quick. The third is 79 from Nice, France. I can't get started. We're going to play a clip from that and you give everybody a break. And then we'll just talk about his enlightenment years and his foundation. So again, this again, uh, Illinois J.K., American Legend, 79, from Nice, France, I Can't Get Started. Again, that's from Nice, France, Illinois J.K., I Can't, again, I Can't Wait, from 1979. We're going to take a caller from Area Code 323. Give me a second, I'll put you on the line. Caller, Area Code 323, you're online. Go ahead and pose your question. Hi, it's Hi. not a question. Okay. My grandfather is Gilbert. Gilbert is Illinois' father. Also, my dad's father, Russell, who also played in Uncle's band for many years. He played the trumpet. But I want to give a shout-out to my uncle and to Carol and to Pammy. I, along with family and friends, have the opportunity to follow Uncle and his big band around the world over 25 years. Wow. Uncle always dedicated more than you know to me. And I was so proud and inspired that I just wanted to share that with all of you. And I want to share with all of you that he shared his talent with the world. And thank you for taking my call. Thank you. And go ahead and identify yourself. My name is Jacqueline Jaquette Williams. Okay. That's my cousin. Oh, oh. Tammy. Hey, Carol. Good, good to hear your voice. Good to hear good all to hear of you. you. Okay. This, Take is care. A, this is a very great moment. Thank you for sharing. And Thank I will you take for calling. You Thank take you. care, Thank too. You. Thank you for calling. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> Back to the program. Thank you, Jack- Jacqueline, for calling in. I guess now, since Jacqueline called in, kind of give us the background, I guess, growing up as the daughter of Illinois, and, of course, you had a brother. Did you? any of you actually took on the musical challenge and experience? Um, Tam- Yes, Tim, I would say, and listen, I have to thank Joyce and Carol because I never realized how much I was like my dad. <laughs> I played the drums when I was in high school. I was in the marching band. Uh, my father wanted me to play the piano, but I just 
didn't like the piano. I went over to drums and then converted from drums to flute and then guitar. So those are my instruments. I also tap danced. I didn't tap dance in front of my dad's band, but uh, I did love dance. And I think my dad just kind of instilled in me the appreciation of music so I can understand Joyce's commentary about and prepare, because that is exactly what my father told me I had to do. And every day I would have to practice and prepare in the basement, which he turned into a studio later on where his band used to practice and prepare. So, so much of what I was listening to reminded me of my days growing up with my dad, uh, appreciating education, making sure that I, you know, did my homework. I had to show him my homework, you know, wow. just all of that. Just, it's like flashbacks, it really is. Well, I just, well, I want to say, Pamela, that he always spoke of you, my daughter, the doctor, always. He was so yeah, proud. Yeah, I didn't go into music, though, yeah. because looking at the way my father's life was sort of like a roller coaster in the music business, I thought I needed a little bit more stability, <laughs> so I chose mm-hmm. medicine. Yeah. But interestingly enough, most people who appreciate medicine have a very keen appreciation of music as well. It's very closely related in the brain. So I could have flipped a coin and been a musician. I flipped a coin and became a physician. Yeah. Well, he was so proud of you. And to be honest, Tim, I didn't really learn about my father's contribution to music until I was actually in college. I went to Howard University in Washington, D.C., and I took a course called History of Jazz, very similar to Carol's son, and the instructor was Donald Byrd. And to this day, I thank him for, it was a year course. I was a science major. I had no business being in the School of Fine Arts. But I was determined to learn as much about jazz outside of my home environment to really get an understanding of what his contribution was. And it was a final course that taught me the impact not only of my father's contribution, but the contribution of jazz music to the history of this country. And it's very important that we continue to educate. This is something that is our gold golden nugget in this country. We must keep it alive. So, yes, it was a phenomenal... I mean, I had a great life. I, I couldn't trade it in for anything. Wow. Speaking of that, you know, his early, I think, with 1994, playing on the stage with President Clinton, what was that like? Did he express... Uh, oh, he was so excited. And I know Carol can and add to that, but he, you know... <laughs> Here I was in college, a college graduate, went to school in D.C., had never been to the White House until I went with my father. And to walk across the White House lawn, the East Lawn, to see the stage, to see all of these people there, to hear this music, it was such an honor. I can't tell you how many times my heart is opened with the honors that my dad received. Very many he was alive and very many since his passing, but it's always wonderful, and I'm extremely proud of him, his contribution. But yeah, that was a jam session like no other in the White House. Wow. He was not, not only playing with him, but the president was playing Illinois Jacquette's horn. Yes. Yeah. It was only there. Uh, I had packed away his horn already because Illinois had been finished playing, and then all of a sudden, Illinois signals to me because he got the sense that it was going to go up on stage. And he, he told me to run, get the horn. I hurried up and got it out of the case again and got it. I just ran down just in time to hand it to somebody to hand it to Clinton as he was going on stage. And if he had played Illinois' horn for the inaugural ball in 1992, they told, asked, they called Illinois and asked him, would you please bring a second horn, second tenor saxophone, because the people around Clinton were trying to downplay his music. And they knew that he wouldn't have a horn with him. So <laughs> Illinois took his gold-plated saxophone down along with, went on the bus down to Washington. And he played the, his gold horn there, came on stage and jammed with him. See Jam Booze. Wow. Great story. Great wow. story. Great. It is, really is. And talking about, I think, his enlightenment years and other scholarships, you mentioned he was a student of yoga. He took this enlightenment journey. Can you talk about that, Carolyn? Yes. 
that he said that was one of the most important things ever happened to him in his life. He didn't know what he would have done had he not been introduced to Siddha Yoga. Siddha Yoga is explained to him how he had experienced. See, he experienced life on a deeper level than the average person. And that's why he was so unusual and his music was so deep is because he was anchored in the everybody has love in their hearts but they if they can't access it easily they're looking always to the exterior world to try to access and try to find that feel love but he was uh, Eleanor Jaquette was firmly anchored in his love in his heart and when he played his music he was playing from that love in his heart so that Every note that came out of his horn was love in the form of sound. Then when that reached the listener, it had the power to awaken the love in that listener's heart. And that's what stirred them. That's what. That's why they reacted to him the way they did. Now, when he studied Siddha Yoga, and we made five trips, five extended trips, several weeks, maybe a month at a time, to India to study Kashmir Shaivism, which is where this Siddha Yoga comes from. Siddha Yoga is a study of how to become a Siddha. A Siddha is a realized being who realizes he's one with the love in his heart. So when Illinois saw this ancient, centuries-old teachings, explained exactly how he'd experienced life. So it was was just a revelation to him. He finally understood where he was. And so he, I know, you know, he he said he always experienced life through feeling, through the feeling body. We have four bodies, the physical body, the feeling body, the subtle body, the causal body, which is the body that we're in when we're in deep sleep with no dreams. And the fourth state, there's someone from the CLA just wrote a book about the scientific discovery of the fourth state, and he learned in, in India what how he had experienced life. And I think that today he's still on that plane because he lived on the plane of love, and now he is on the plane of love, and we just have to access it. Players, musicians that were in his band who loved him so dearly still experience him when they're playing their music. Every time his music is played, when they have the the tributes to him every summer, because for 16 straight years, from the inception of the Lincoln Center's Midsummer Night Swing Series till his passing for 16 straight years, he was the closing night act. So now they still celebrate on closing night, Jaquette's night, they celebrate and Pay tribute to him, and the dancers, everybody there still feels he's with them. So he's with us on the plane of love. We just have to, <laughs> we just have to discover a way to access it. Okay, and so, I would have to, I would have to corroborate that just on a personal level. When I'm practicing drums, sometimes you know, sense his presence. I don't know how to explain that in words, but. It goes beyond words. Yeah. It goes beyond our mind. It, our minds can't even comprehend those ancient mm-hmm. teachings because they, it, they're beyond our mind. But our sense can feel it. You feel it. That's what you're doing. You're feeling his presence. You're feeling it. Comes in, it comes into your body and your mind. When I'm studying soprano saxophone as well, and sometimes I definitely feel the sound com- you know, coming through me and through the horn that I don't know where it's coming from. It's so I, I attribute that to all the years that I played drums with him over those years as a, someone in my mid thirties. You're eter- you're e- <clears throat> excuse me, you're eternally connected to him through music. Wow. And Carol, can you talk about the Hall of Fame, the Apollo Center? I got some information about that. Yes, the, I recently I think I emailed you the my pitch to them telling them a Hall of Fame at the Apollo would be missing, if would be incomplete if they didn't have Illinois Jaquette because he played such a, he was so 
important up there. He said that <clears throat> he told me that he was the first artist that asked for and got a percentage of the door because his drawing power was so tremendous. Wow. Just, and so in addition to that, he just, he named one of his biggest hits was, was called Port of Rico. It was a, something he recorded with Count Basie. He was a guest on Count, one of Count Basie's recording sessions on the organ. So it was just him and Count Basie on the organ, and he named it Port of Rico. And there was, there was an interesting stagehand who was at the Apollo who was in charge of the sound. And his, his name actually was Porto Rico, P O R T O R I C O. He actually had a, a, an American name too, but he would shoot, he would get when acts would come on the stage that were not good and they wanted to get rid of him. Why like he would go? Can he? He would dress up. He's a real character. Anyway, Illinois named his one of his big hits was Puerto Rico. So he was de deeply connected to the Apollo Theater. Okay, I'm going to play a clip. We only have about 13 minutes left in the show. There's uh, about the Chapel of the Sisters dedication. So I'm going to play that. It's about three minutes long. And we can talk about that next and uh, talk about, make some closing remarks from each person. I'm going to about to play Illinois JK Performance Space at the 150 year old Chapel of Sisters in New York. And here is the clip. Yeah, that's the Chapel of the Three Sisters. Chapel of the Sisters in Prospect Cemetery is among the oldest structures in Jamaica, Queens. It dates back to the 1850s when Nicholas Ludlam built the memorial to his three daughters who died in childhood. Over time, the property was forgotten and the cemetery all but abandoned until one of Ludlam's long-lost descendants rediscovered the historic grounds. I was overwhelmed when I first saw the grounds. When I walked into the chapel, I wept. I had never seen a building so destroyed. It was something I couldn't walk away from, even had I not had relatives here. I couldn't leave it alone. So basically, I sought out help in the local community here. I became involved with Greater Jamaica and the New York Landmarks Conservancy. Greater Jamaica Development Corporation sees historic places in Jamaica as a major anchor for economic development here. These cultural resources give the place a richness and they are attractive. They pull people in and we believe that they should be fostered and they should be part of the new plan for Jamaica. The chapel itself is beautiful and the cemetery it contains an enormous amount of history of Queens. Revolutionary War soldiers are buried here. Very important families have always had their family lost here. The names on these tombstones takes you back. Queens is an early part of America, early part of America. Thanks to a collaboration of efforts, the chapel reopened in 2008 as the Illinois Jacquet Performance Space, fittingly named for a jazz musician who lived in Queens. The old chapel will be the new home of York College's Jazz Ensemble. Illinois was a, a spiritual person, and he would love the idea that the program here would have his name on it. By establishing the Illinois Jaquette performance space in this chapel, it allows his spirit to stay alive and to inspire the young students and to keep them nourished with the wonderful jazz music. Hopefully we will animate this space and have lots of music here. It's a wonderful facility. It's gorgeous inside. It's easy to get to. It's right by the train station. It's a wonderful addition to York College. We have a wonderful jazz program here at the college. I almost couldn't stand still when I heard the music. It is an incredibly rich cultural resource and historic resource. This is one of the few historic places on the campus. It's a perfect building, I think, for them and a wonderful space to celebrate life. That connection between performer and audience is a unique connection. And out of a space like this, dedicated today in the spirit of Illinois, next to one of the oldest cemeteries in New York, is, I think, a wonderful union of history and future. Check out the website for a schedule of performances. Again, that was a clip from the, uh, the Chapel of the Sisters. And getting ready to close, uh, Carolyn, can you talk about how did that chapel come about? I mean, and then 
they how they contact you? Uh, yes. At the time, they were creating the new terminal that connects JFK to the Jamaica Railroad Station called Air Train. They were, the Greater Jamaica Development Corporation was trying to, uh, and they did, put the theme of jazz music into that train station. And so they were asking my input. And when I saw the prospective poster for Flying Home, it was a picture of Ella Fitzgerald and didn't say anything about Illinois Duquette. So I called Peter, you, whom you saw on that clip, who was in charge of it. And I said, Peter, and I told him, you know, how mistaken they were. And he then he kind of like out of his back hip pocket, out of protection, he said, oh, well, I know how we could really pay tribute to Illinois Jaquette. There's this chapel that they've been trying to get for decades. They've been trying to get it restored. And he said, maybe if we said it would, if we made it a, a farming space and named it for Illinois Jaquette, maybe that would be a handle that would allow it to get restored. I said, great. I'll take it to Helen Marshall. And you said, oh, you know her that well? <laughs> of course, Helen's been a fan since Flying Home Days. You saw her on the clip, too. And she's the president of our borough of Queens. So she said, oh, thank you, for Carol, for bringing this idea to me. And she came up with six figures to get it restored. And that's why, that's how it, Helen Marshall, I tell her, she waved her magic wand and got it done. And now these students... That was Illinois' first love, was to try to inspire students, young people, and get them uh, to know the magic of jazz music and how it can enhance their lives. And so Tom, whom you saw, Tom Slabinger, he's from Austria, he is doing a wonderful job keeping the students excited and enthused about jazz music. And now, every year... Every October, in honor of Illinois' uh, day on Halloween, they play the Texas tenor at the chapel, plus all of the students, when they have their graduation recitals, they have their graduation recital there, and it's just a wonderful place to keep Illinois' spirit alive and with young people. Wow. And how many, how many of the chapel seats in general? Not, that's the problem. It's not enough. That's a real problem because when they put the big band in there, then there's not a lot of room for people left. It's like the space is like 40 feet by 40 feet, which is not a lot. But in the summertime, they leave the doors open and you oh, know, okay. people fill out. And so it works. It's working. It's not a failure in that terms of space. It's just not. It's difficult. If it were bigger, it would be better. But how big can a chapel be? Yeah, well, at least they reserve something historical. Now, is in the is it part of the cemetery? It's right adjacent to it. Then the cemetery dates dates back to 1660. There are Revolutionary War heroes there, wow. and there are some black slaves who are have prominent families from early New York insisted that their slaves be buried with them. Which is, uh, uh, for that time, is unusual. Yeah, it is. Let's talk about the, in closing, talk about this foundation. And in general, then we'll take comments from from Pamela and also Joyce. And I'm going to put Jackie on the spot. And Pamela will be the last person. Just talk about his foundation and tell us how can they make contributions and so forth. Uh, well, well, Pam. Let Pamela talk about how they can make contributions and things. Go ahead. You, you know, because of his concern for education, there are two things that we did. We started a scholarship in his name at Juilliard, where he received his honorary doctorate degree in music. Wow. And we started a foundation, 501c3 Foundation Charitable Organization, to provide scholarships and to continue education in jazz music, focusing on the saxophone, as well as trying to preserve many of his musical compositions and films and recordings for colleges and universities 
that have jazz and musical departments. So last year we had an event held here in Scottsdale at the Musical Instrument Museum, which is one of the only museums of its kind in the United States, has about 10,000 different instruments from all over the world. We donated one of my dad's instruments and had a ceremony at the event, and we're hoping to generate interest, continued interest, and continuing funding for educational programs that deal with jazz. So we can ask all of those wonderful listeners there out in the radio world that they can contribute to the Illinois Jacket Foundation by going to IllinoisJacket.org or IllinoisJacketFoundation.org, and there'll be a button for you to push, and you can continue to donate and find out what's going on with the foundation. We have a lot of different activities that we're planning, and we will be sending out emails and alerting people of the events. So it's a wonderful side project. It takes a lot of time and dedication to do, but very happy to do it. Great. So is it in Arizona or is it in New York, the foundation? The foundation is based in New York. I live part-time in Arizona and part-time in New York, New Jersey area. But the Musical Instrument Museum happened to have been in Phoenix. And so they approached us last year, early part of last year, wanting to know if we would be interested in donating one of the dad's saxophones to the museum. It's, I must encourage you to go to the website, I Am Musical Instrument Museum, and just listen to what this museum is all about. It's really fantastic. Okay. And a lot of his works, sheet music and things, are that still housed with his foundation in New York? Yes. Yeah, and that's what we're trying to do, to look into getting grants and funding to preserve this, because now you have to do things differently. They're going to have to be done, you know, on a computer. No more paper saving, no more files, and it's a totally different technological world we live in. And so it's going to take a little bit of money to reproduce and transfer all that information to a computer. So it's a labor of love that both Carol and I share, and we're trying to continuously generate interest and funding for these kinds of projects. Okay, great. Great. So you're there in the works of putting all this together electronically. The last comments, I know I'm going to go off the air in the next 40 seconds, but you're still going to get taped. I guess to close out, anything you would like to say in closing? I think that this was, first of all, I thank you for your dedication and interest for educating the world about music, but particularly about my dad. I thank Joyce immensely for her commentary. I think she opened my eyes. I'm sure I opened hers. I thank Carol for her dedication and interest in preserving my dad's legacy. And, of course, I thank my cousin who called in, who's very much a part of all the efforts that we try to do to keep my dad's and her dad's legacy alive. So I I can't tell you how happy I am that I was a part of this program, and I thank you very much. Thank you. I really appreciate it. Joyce, you have any final comments? Joyce Hoffman? Uh, Yes, I just wanted to say really what Pamela said is, It's been amazing just to do this show with Pamela, Illinois Jacquette's daughter, and Carol Sherrick, his longtime devoted personal manager and business manager and music. She's a consummate musician in her own right, and it's been such an honor to be us sharing stories with these wonderful, strong women. Right. And also, before we get to uh, Carol, I put Jackie on the, I mean Jacqueline on the spot. Hey, Jacqueline. Hey, I just want the world to know that they must continue my uncle and my dad's legacy and support this foundation of my uncle's. Please visit the website. It's so important and continue the legacy of promoting jazz to the world. Thank you for having us. Great. And Carol. Yes. I want to thank you, Tim, for initiating this and for Pamela and Jackie and Joyce being with us. It's just wonderful. The world needs to know what a wonderful being passed through here and whose energy is still here and can inspire all. And we try to keep his spirit alive through his foundation. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Again, it's been another broadcast of Blog Talk Radio, Apple Capital Group, Illinois JK, and the American Jazz Legend. 
Again, you can t- contact his foundation at IllinoisJKFoundation.org, or you can download this episode on iTunes, also Blog Feed and Blog Talk Radio. Thank you, Callan Shurik, Pamela J.K. Davis, George Hoffman, Jacqueline J.K. as well was on the line. Thank you for joining the program today, and have a great weekend. You too, Jim. Thank Bye, you. Everybody. Thank Bye. you. Goodbye, everybody. Bye-bye. Great Bye. day. Take care. Thank you.